Daniel Eric Markle, who went by Dan, was born in Toronto, Canada on October 9, 1972. After high school, Dan attended Harvard before studying abroad at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. After returning to the U.S., he enrolled at Emmanuel College in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he obtained his master's degree and then earned his law degree from Harvard Law School. After that, he began practicing law in Florida and quickly became a well-known, respected attorney. He worked as a law clerk for a federal judge and then as an associate at a law firm before finally joining the faculty at the Florida State University School of Law in Tallahassee in 2005. A year earlier, in 2004, while on the Jewish dating app, JDate, he met Wendy Adelson, a University of Miami Law School student. Wendy was born in Florida on April 22, 1979, to parents Donna and Harvey. She also had two siblings, Charles and Robert. Her father, Harvey, was a cosmetic dentist who founded the Adelson Institute for Aesthetic and Implant Dentistry, where her mother, Donna, and brother Charles also worked. Wendy would then graduate from the University of Miami Law School in 2006. After Dan was hired on at the Florida State University Law School, Wendy was also offered a contract teaching position. The two dated for a couple of years and then married in February of 2006. However, the issues with their marriage began at the wedding. Dan was very committed to his Jewish religion and wanted his wedding to be strictly kosher. However, even though Wendy and her parents assured him the catered food would be kosher, in the end, it wasn't, and that devastated Dan. This began the divide between him and his in-laws. After getting married, they settled back in Tallahassee, but Wendy wasn't happy with this and allegedly wanted more than anything to be back in Miami. Three years after Dan and Wendy married, they had their first son in 2009 and then their second son in 2010. During this time, Dan kept a very busy lifestyle, which Wendy felt kept her from pursuing her own career goals. Years later, she even confessed in a podcast that she did for a writing class that she didn't feel like Dan viewed her as an equal. She even said, I thought I could cheat the system and marry a man I lacked passionate love for. She then began working on a novel called This Is Our Story, which had a character who had fallen out of love. To those who knew her, it felt more like an autobiography, and when Dan failed to read the book, it devastated her. In 2012, Dan traveled to New York City, where he told a friend that Wendy had become distant and depressed, and he felt like his marriage was slowly unraveling. Before he left on the trip, Wendy had decided she had had enough of living in Tallahassee and put a plan into motion. While Dan was gone, she packed up everything, including the furniture and her two sons, and moved back to Miami. When Dan returned from New York City, he was shocked to find only his bed and divorce papers. For the next six weeks, Wendy, with the help from her mother Donna and brother Charles, hid out, refusing to tell Dan where his kids were. By July 2013, their divorce was finalized. Wendy then filed a motion to relocate the kids to Miami, while Dan filed an order to forbid her from doing that. By the end of 2013, he had won the order, but it wasn't over yet. The court had yet to decide on the parenting arrangements, finances, and the distribution of assets. In the meanwhile, Dan filed a motion with the courts asking for constant supervision while his children were with Donna because of the negative comments she was making about Dan. During a Skype call with his children, one of his sons told him that Donna had called him stupid. Donna then became obsessed with finding a way to overturn the court's decision and get her grandchildren closer to her. One of her crazy ideas was to convert the children to Christianity, thinking Dan would disown his children if they weren't Jewish. The custody battle had basically turned very bitter, and in mid-2014, everything came to a head. On July 18, 2014, at 11 a.m., Dan was sitting in his black Honda Accord in his garage on the phone with a friend when someone approached him. The person on the phone then heard a loud bang and tried calling out for Dan, but there was no response. Neighbors also heard the noise, looked out the window, and saw a car speeding away. After that, they called 911, telling the operator that Dan's car window was busted out and he had blood all over his head. Sadly, he had been shot at point-blank range and would die the following day at the hospital. 
After the shooting, they notified Dan's parents and also brought Wendy in for questioning where they informed her of the shooting. Here's the video of her reaction. Daniel all right, has been taken to the hospital. Um, he's not going to survive. Oh my God. Okay. Before we get into everything, I have to establish where you were and who you were with and so forth. Okay. okay? And then once we've established all that, I can give you more details. Okay. Do you understand why I wanted you to come here before I discuss this? Oh my God. <laughs> Can you let me let me get over this hump, okay? Can we do that first? All right. Can you tell me? What time you left your house this morning? Yeah, I was there. Um, I didn't leave this morning. I didn't leave until noon. Okay. And oh my God. And I tried to drive up Trescott and I saw that it was blocked. Uh, it was blocked at some point. I'm not sure what time it was blocked. And I just thought, oh, there's maybe some trees down or something. Sometimes oh, you're saying as you drove down which one of the side roads? When I, I'm going to a friend's party tonight and it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, um, Oh my God, what am I even talking about? I needed to buy, it's a stock the stock the shelf engagement party and so I went to buy bourbon. Okay. So I went to drive from my place <laughs> up Trescott to get to ABC Liquor and it was blocked. So I just turned around, I was on the phone at the time. I wasn't paying a lot of attention. Right. Um, and I, so I just turned around and drove up the other way. I just thought, oh, sometimes there's, when I lived there, there electrical things okay. that would happen. During the interrogation, she began going through different people who could have possibly shot Dan. Family actually just talked to my brother this morning. My, my parents are in Coral Springs. Okay. Um, and my brother, the, I have two brothers, but I'm very close to one of them who is in, um, in Fort Lauderdale. Okay. All right. So everybody's, that's where you're from originally, I take it? Yeah. Okay. All right. His family's in Canada. Did they know? Did you tell them? No, they haven't been notified yet. Oh my yet. God. His parents are going to be devastated. <laughs> okay. This is what I want to do, okay? I'm, I'm, this is what happened, okay? Daniel's been shot, okay? And we have to find out why and who did this. Can you help with that? I will try. Okay. What I what I want to do right now to try to extradite things, okay, but I need your permission, is I want to take your cell phone and download all the information out of it. Do sure. You have, do you have a problem with that? No. Okay. Can you do that? Yes. Okay. I got to get a form for you to sign, and then I'm going to get the phone started, okay? Oh, my God. I... I have a lot of friends. I know. How do you know that? Well, you had two of them up there for a last minute lunch date, right? Last minute. Well, I, I mean, they, you you went up there, you're sitting with them, you have friends. I do. What I meant by it is that Danny didn't treat me very well, and okay. I'm so scared that maybe someone did this. Not because they hate Danny, but because they thought this was good somehow. Oh, are you saying that you think maybe one of your friends would have done something Who like would this? Do this? I don't know. 
that's why I'm that's why you're here and that's why we're talking would you ever ask someone to do something like this not in a million years okay do you think someone would do this for your benefit without asking you no what good does it serve I made my brother um, the one his name's Charlie the one I'm really close to he makes a lot of jokes in bad taste and it was a joke he made he bought the TV for me this morning that got broken and I was talking to him about whether it made sense to pay to fix it or whether I should get a new one and it was always his joke that like he knew Danny treated me badly and it was always his joke he said I I you know I looked into hiring a hitman and it was cheaper to get you this TV so instead I got you this TV um, I mean he would never He's my big brother, and he's been taking care of me since I was little, but he would never. And I, I said, I told that to the repair guy this morning. Right. That's okay. I said, he asked me how much it cost, and I said I didn't know because it was a gift, because my brother said it was cheaper than a hitman. It was my divorce present. Okay. Such a horrible thing to say. I'm so sorry. It's okay. <laughs> But even my family, who felt like I had been mistreated, would never do something like this. Never. I'm going to come sit over here on this side of you, if you don't mind. Uh, so I have to meet you under these circumstances. I'm usually a lot more fun. Okay. The idea that I would ever do anything is like, I understand, I understand why they need to check, but I don't know. I don't know who would though. I don't know who would do this. I can see why they would think it would be me. Well, I, I, I don't think. And did Investigator Ison talk to you at all about like what your role is in this? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. And, <laughs> and a lot of times they do stuff just to kind of cancel you out too. At one point, she mentions her boyfriend, Jeffrey Lacasse. What was a how, okay? How long have you been seeing Jeff? Since the end of September. Okay. All right, and so since September, you all have been seeing each other exclusively? Um, in the fall, I was dating someone else, too, and the relationship really evolved around February. Um, you know, I post-divorce, so I was kind of slow to, like, um, but so I jokingly used to call him my special man friend, and around February, he started being more like my boyfriend, he started spending some time with the kids, and um, they really adore him and I introduced him as mommy's friend not as mommy's boyfriend so they just think of him as Jeffrey and he plays Star Wars with them and um, he didn't like Danny because Danny hurt me so I see why he's a good suspect it's like what if it's Jeff like then I did this by asking for some time away from him I made him crazy when Jeffrey comes in for his interview he talks about his hate for Dan and what he did to Wendy he also talks about how charismatic Wendy is and how he was so in love with her that he would throw himself in front of a bus for her. I was in love with this girl, man, so it's hard. And she really has this charisma and this sexuality, and so, you know, he throws himself in front of a bus for this girl. And you've never had any kind of physical contact with Danny? No. I'm surprised you guys didn't call me earlier, though, because I probably said a hundred times in public that I like to kick his ass because he kept, like, <laughs> really making Wendy suffer and things like that. Right. But no, I would never. I'm a professor and I'm a... I'm not going to do anything like that. No, no. However, they were in the middle of breaking up, and Jeffrey had a solid alibi, as he was in Atlanta at the time of the murder. However, in a shocking twist, Jeffrey tells the detective who he suspects murdered Dan. I have something I want to tell you, but I want it off the I want to concern about my safety with what I'm going to tell you. Danny Markell just got killed, and I don't want to be next. I'm sorry if that sounds paranoid, but uh, I do have some ideas. The family desperately wants her back in South Florida. Mother, father, and she has a brother. If I could just say, I would be investigating Charlie Adelson. Now, I don't know if he did this. But if you're looking at somebody, don't miss him. The whole family's real weird. Something's up with this family. They hate Danny in a way. I've never seen this kind of obsession. Like their hobby is hating Danny. <laughs> Even family friends were interviewed and couldn't believe what the Adelsons had done to Dan during the divorce proceedings. They hated Danny, really. They hated, they hated Danny. Danny. I think they were mean. 
I think they, I mean, to do some of the stuff that they did during this divorce with Danny is just not reasonable. My parents have more reason to dislike Danny than almost anyone else. He hurt their daughter. They're very angry with him. But even my family, who felt like I had been mistreated, would never do something like this. Never. When investigators began looking at footage from places Dan had been on the day of the murder, they noticed that a Toyota Prius began following Dan as he was leaving the gym. They eventually traced that Prius back to a rental company in Miami and found the renter's names, Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia. However, they initially couldn't find a link between those men and Dan. Regardless, Garcia was arrested for the murder, and Rivera was already behind bars after being arrested during a raid on the Latin Kings that he was the leader of. When investigators began looking at the suspect's acquaintances, they came across the mother of Sigfrido Garcia's children, Katie Magbano. They found that Garcia had been in constant contact with her on the day of the murder. They then decided to pull her bank records and noticed that her deposits spiked after Dan's murder. Those deposits were traced right back to the Adelson's dentistry clinic and were signed by none other than Wendy's mom, Donna. As investigators continued digging, they discovered a pretty damning photo of Katie hanging out on a beach with Wendy. They also discovered that Katie had dated Charles between 2012 and 2015. But what did Charles have to do with all of this? Still trying to make a solid connection, they remembered a comment that Wendy had made during her original interview on the day Dan was murdered. Be badly, and it was always this joke. He said, "I, I, you know, I looked into hiring a hitman, and it was cheaper to get you this TV. So instead, I got you this TV." While Wendy told detectives it was just a joke, her ex-boyfriend Jeffrey told a completely different story. She told me that Charlie had looked into having Danny killed in the summer of 2013. She meant it dead serious. I like I joke around, I like to kill Dan Mark Carlin, sick of it. That's different. She said it in a dead serious, chilling, uncomfortable kind of way. In the moment, I was like, my stomach flipped. I was like, whoa. At this point, Donna and Charles were at the top of the suspect list and even went as far as to wiretap their phones. In an attempt to catch them off guard, they had an undercover FBI agent walk up to Donna on the street and hand her a newspaper article about Dan's murder with a number on it. Mrs. Adelson? The bearded man is an undercover agent wearing a body camera. Oh, Listen. You? <laughs> You're scared. No, don't be scared. He's posing as the brother of Luis Rivera. And I want to let you know that my brother, he helped your family with this problem you guys had up north. He's going through some rough times and we want to make sure that you take care of, the, of what he's going through. Well, this will explain it. Thank you. She has the paper, they're walking away. After making her take the piece of paper, he walked away. She then calls the number on the paper, and the undercover FBI agent tells her they need $5,000 extra dollars for the hit, to which she replies, I'll have to call you back. After hanging up, she called Charles, and they began speaking very cryptically about the paper she was handed. If they were innocent in the whole situation, why would they need to talk in such a cryptic way? After hanging up with him, he called Katie and told her to figure out who was demanding the money. Clearly smarter than the Adelsons, she tells him it's most likely the FBI, but he doesn't believe her. However, throughout all their cryptic conversations, never once did anyone confess to being a part of Dan's murder. Toward the end of 2016, Luis Rivera, who knew he was facing the death penalty, took a plea deal and turned state witness. He told investigators that Sigfrido Garcia was hired through Katie by a lady who wanted full custody of her two kids. He offered Rivera $35,000 to assist in the hit. He said that after the hit, Garcia called Katie and let her know the hit was done. Katie was then arrested and also charged with first-degree murder. Katie and Garcia were then tried together in October 2019. During the trial, Wendy was brought in to testify and confirm that she knew Katie. Then her former boyfriend, Jeffrey, was brought in and told the court that Charles had said he looked into all options to take care of the problem, referring to Dan. When Rivera was put on the stand, he was asked who hired Garcia to do the hit, and he said the Adelson family threw Katie. He also says that he was paid his portion with stacks of $100 bills, and the stacks were stapled together. When Charles's ex-girlfriend, June, took the stand, she dropped a bombshell. Are you aware of a large safe that's there in the residence? 
There is a safe. Okay, and during the time that you were dating him, did he have money in that safe, cash? I believe so. All right, and did he have thousands and thousands of dollars, stacks of hundreds? Did you say that? I believe at one point in time. Did you say, quote, hundreds are like dollars to him? I did say that. Did you say that, quote, all of his money is like stapled together, the hundreds in bundles? I believe I did say that. She said that when she dated Charles, he would always keep his money stapled together. As for Katie, she maintained she took no part in the murder and that the large amount of money she was now receiving was because she was working as Charles Adelson's assistant. She then throws Charles under the bus, saying she believes he was involved in Dan's murder. In the end, the jury found Garcia guilty of first-degree murder, but a mistrial was declared for Katie. Garcia was then sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Finally, on April 21, 2022, Charles Adelson was arrested and charged with first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and solicitation to commit murder. Wendy and Donna were also named co-conspirators but were not charged. Katie was then retried, and on May 27, 2022, she was also found guilty of first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and solicitation to commit murder. Just like Garcia, she was given life in prison without the possibility of parole. Charles's trial began on October 26, 2023, and on November 6, just like Katie, he was found guilty of first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, and solicitation of murder. Seven days later, on November 13th, 73-year-old Donna Adelson was arrested at the Miami International Airport and charged with the same crimes, first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and solicitation of murder. Sadly, after the original arrest of Rivera and Garcia in 2016, Wendy no longer allowed Dan's parents to have contact with their grandsons. She also changed their last names from Markle to Adelson. Unfortunately, grandparents in Florida had no rights to visitations and were not even allowed to petition the court for it. In 2022, the Markle Act, which gives grandparents legal visitation rights, was signed into law by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. At this time, no trial date has been set for Donna. Charles, on the other hand, will be sentenced on December 12th. While Wendy has not been charged with any crimes, given the fact that they waited to arrest Donna after Charles was found guilty, it could only be a matter of time. And isn't it true that her parents, anytime they would want Wendy to come down with the boys, they would actually drive up to Tallahassee, pick her up, and drive her back down? That's what she reported. I want to be cautious because I know her to be a person that doesn't always tell me the truth, but that's what I was told. Yes. Well, you just brought me into a whole new line of questioning. Okay. Okay. Um, let's talk about her ability to tell the truth. Okay. You know her very well. You were dating her for a long time. Well, a few months, seriously, okay. but go ahead. How would you describe her when it's, you know, trying to determine whether or not she's telling the truth? I found her to be a deeply deceitful person and not that great at it. That, that was my impression. Would she occasionally just put on a show, try to get people to feel sorry for her? Wendy adopted the victim role as her default social role, her way of getting attention, sympathy, etc. Yes. Did she play the victim role to you about how awful Danny, Danny was to her? Yes. And did she constantly complain about that, what a terrible person he was to her? <laughs> Endlessly, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, and this is, of course, all the only information you're getting from this is through Wendy Adelson's mouth, right? 95% of it. I mean, I also live in Tallahassee. We have a community. I heard some other things. But she had managed to persuade most of the rest of the community that what she was saying was true at the time. So, yeah. So, would you say she did that frequently? Like, she'd speak openly about how upset she was with her divorce? Mm -hmm. Yes, it was the top of, of conversation. If we went to dinner with friends, that's what we were going to talk about. It, frankly, it got old. And she worked at the same place he did, right? Yes, they both worked at the College so she, of Law. So she was disparaging him amongst his colleagues as well, too, right? I can only, as far as what I witnessed, yeah, we went to dinner with some law professors where she 
She did that sort and of And she'd way. actively talk badly about her divorce in front of them? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, one thing that Wendy was very vocal to you about during their relationship was how much she hated Tallahassee, right? Yes. Okay. And that was almost a daily conversation, how much she hated living here. Yeah. Danny was part one. How bad Tallahassee was part two. That was the plot of every day, basically. And that's why you kind of say it started to get old, because those are basically the things that you would talk about over and over and over again. Yes. Okay. And she blamed Dan Markell for being stuck in Tallahassee. There's no question about that. No, she did blame... Well, she blamed Dan Markell for getting her stuck in Tallahassee, yes. Had you ever heard her say that if something happened to him, she'd be able to go home? Yeah, and that night that I related to Miss Kappelman, June, or excuse me, July 13th, mm -hmm. Uh, part of that conversation was, if anything ever happened to Danny, she would probably, you know, not probably, she, she would return to South Florida. Now, and that's actually what happened in this case, right? It's exactly what happened in this case, a week later. Yeah. As soon as he was murdered, less than a week later, she was in South Florida. That's my understanding. All right. In 1977, 22-year-old Martha Ann Johnson was living in Fulton County, Georgia with her third husband, Earl Bowen, and her two kids from a previous marriage, Jenny Ann Wright and James Taylor. Jenny Ann was born on October 11, 1970, during Martha's first marriage, and 23-month-old James was born on October 30, 1975, during her second marriage. Unfortunately, on September 25th, the first of many tragedies would occur. When Martha went to wake James up from his nap, she found him unresponsive. He was rushed to the hospital, where he was sadly pronounced dead, and the cause of death was listed as Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, or SIDS. The family was devastated, but slowly moved on. On June 13, 1978, Martha gave birth to her third child, Earl Wayne Bowen Jr., and over two years later, on September 2, 1980, Martha gave birth to her fourth child, Tabitha Janelle Bowen. Three months later, on November 30th, tragedy would strike again. Tabitha, just like James, was found unresponsive when Martha went to wake her up from a nap. Paramedics attempted to revive her but were unsuccessful, and her cause of death was listed as SIDS, the same as James. Once again, everyone was devastated, but for investigators, they chalked it up to bad luck. However, Earl Sr. was becoming suspicious, and doctors felt that two children dying from SIDS in the same family were improbable. Sadly, for Martha's remaining children, this horrible ordeal was far from over. In January of 1981, Earl Jr. was found with a package of rat poison. He was rushed to the hospital, where he was treated and released. Martha and Earl said that after that, Earl Jr. began suffering from seizures. During one of those seizures on February 12, 1981, he was rushed to the hospital, and while on the way, he went into cardiac arrest. He was revived but placed on life support. Doctors concluded that he was ultimately brain dead and was removed from life support three days later. At this point, the only surviving child was 10-year-old Jenny Ann. Even with the deaths of three of Martha's children, the investigation, if there ever was one, didn't find anything suspicious about their deaths, basically allowing Martha to go on with her life. Sadly, this left Jenny Ann right in harm's way. Sometime in late 1981 or early 1982, Jenny Ann began complaining of chest pains and was prescribed Tylenol and a rib belt. For those unfamiliar with it, a rib belt is used to compress the rib cage, which can sometimes lessen the pain while moving around. Then on February 21, 1982, paramedics were called after 11-year-old Jenny Ann was found face down on Martha's bed, foaming from the mouth. Sadly, they were unable to resuscitate her, and her cause of death was asphyxiation. After all four children died unexpectedly, Earl Sr. left, and the couple divorced. Martha would then get married for a fourth time to Charles Johnson and move to Locust Grove, Georgia. Seven years would go by without a serious investigation into the sudden death of all four of Martha's children. That is until December 1988, when an article was published in the Atlanta Constitution that questioned the deaths of the children. This led investigators to reopen the cases. 
Once they began looking into the suspicious deaths, they realized that seven to ten days before each one, Martha and Earl Sr. had gotten into nasty arguments, causing him to leave their home. It was almost as if Martha was killing her children as retaliation against Earl for their confrontations with each other. After each death, Earl, stricken with grief, would return and they would patch things up. However, every separation led to another dead child. It was also revealed that after Earl Jr.'s funeral in 1981, Jenny Ann told her father that she was afraid to be in the home with her mother. However, welfare workers interviewed the family and could find no legal ground to have her removed. During the reinvestigation, Dr. William Anderson took another look at James's SIDS diagnosis and determined it was most likely wrong, and he was 90% sure it was a homicide. On July 3, 1989, with this latest information in hand, police arrested Martha and charged her with Jenny Ann's murder. She then confessed to killing Jenny Ann and James. She said that she rolled her 250-pound body on the children as they slept, basically suffocating them to death. She even admitted that her actions were to punish Earl Sr. However, she denied being responsible for the deaths of Tabitha and Earl Jr., her two youngest children. Almost a year later, before the start of her April 1990 trial, she tried to recant her confession, but the judge refused to omit the taped confession, and the jury was allowed to see it. On May 5, 1990, Martha was convicted for the murder of Jenny Ann and sentenced to life in prison. So why did it take so many years to prosecute Martha? Investigators blamed it on her change of address and the different jurisdictions between Clayton County and Fulton County. However, there was also the problem with doctors misdiagnosing the cause of death of her first three children. It wasn't until Jenny Ann's murder that prosecution was even considered, but the Clayton County DA at the time never followed up. Even Earl Sr. had become suspicious of the deaths, but couldn't persuade authorities to do something. Doctors and investigators believe there are other cases out there where children were murdered, but their deaths were ruled as SIDS. Even though Martha was sentenced to life in prison, according to inmate records, she was released on March 23, 2020, after being denied parole five times. Michaela Shunick was born on May 21, 1990 in Louisiana and went by Mickey. She was described as a truly good and special kid who was beautiful inside and out. On May 18, three days before her 22nd birthday, Mickey, a senior at the University of Louisiana in Lafayette, went with some friends to a concert at a live music venue called Artmosphere. After the concert, at 12.44 a.m., Mickey and her friend Bretley rode their bikes back to his house on Rhine Street, which was only about five minutes from the Artmosphere. They then got in Bretley's car and went for a late-night food run to Taco Bell and returned back to his home afterward. At 1.47 a.m., Mickey decided to head home and was caught on surveillance camera riding her bike on Burside Boulevard. She was seen again on St. Landry Street about a minute later. Sadly, after that, she was never seen alive again. Mickey was supposed to attend her brother Zach's graduation ceremony later that day, but failed to show up. Her family went looking for her and even called Brettley, but they were unable to locate her. At 5 p.m., they reported her missing. Friends and family began retracing her bike route on foot, hoping to find any clues as to where she could be, but nothing turned up. The following day, they set up a command center at Brettley's home. When investigators began reviewing surveillance footage, they saw Mickey riding her bike with a white Z-71 truck not far behind her. They searched the area where she was last seen, but were unable to find her or her bike. So, they released the footage of the white truck to the public in hopes that someone might recognize it. A few days later, a tip came in from a woman who said her fiancé, Brandon Scott Laverne, owned a white Z-71 truck. Even more damning was the fact that he had returned home on the 19th with stab wounds. When she asked what happened, he claimed he was stabbed in New Orleans. Laverne was a sex offender who had spent eight years in prison, starting in the year 2000, for aggravated sexual battery. He also had a very troubled history and began receiving treatment for anger and depression when he was 15 years old. He even had a 30-day inpatient stay at Central State Hospital in 1995. 
In the year 2000, Laverne was convicted of aggravated sexual battery and would remain in jail until August of 2008. On May 26, a fisherman discovered Mickey's bicycle under the Whiskey Bay Bridge, which was about 45 minutes away from where she was last seen. On May 31st, San Joaquino County, Texas police found a white C-71 truck burned out but were unaware that it was related to a missing persons case in Louisiana. On June 14, 2012, Lafayette police finally received the information about the burned out truck and were able to trace it back to Laverne. In the meanwhile, Laverne had been trying to acquire a new truck after reporting his truck stolen. A woman had called the police and told them that Laverne tried to buy a truck from her, saying his had been stolen. They would soon learn that Laverne had checked himself into a hospital in New Orleans on May 19th with stab wounds. He said a man with a gold tooth wearing a black hat and a New Orleans Saints jersey with the number 24 on it had stabbed him. I'm sure they were immediately suspicious of this story because it would have been extremely rare to see someone walking around with a Saints jersey bearing the number 24. At the time, there were no famous players who wore that number. At this point, all the evidence was pointing toward Laverne. So on July 5th, police stopped Laverne in his brand new white pickup truck and arrested him on a warrant related to registering as a sex offender. There is a list of issues, okay, we need to address regarding the disappearance of Mickey Shunick. You know, no, nah, bro, you know, that's, that's I didn't have nothing to do with that girl's freaking disappearance. If you say all that to do, I'm open out, bro. I don't want to turn it. Man, it's, it's, it's over with, you know. <laughs> you want to know what this is all about? But basically, we just want to know about Brandon. Did he ever get angry or ever push you or hit you? Never. Or? Not one time. You don't see that at all? I don't. He's never showed that. I've never seen it. I don't even see that in him. I don't. He has been so gentle and kind and compassionate. It's, he's amazing. As I would have never said yes <laughs> to a marriage. Because I'm not sure you know Brandon as well as you think you know. Okay. Okay. I'd like um, to. So. You, you, you'd like to? If there's something I don't know, I, I need yeah. to know. I'm a brutally honest person. Brandon is under arrest for first degree murder. What? Yes. He is, without a reasonable doubt, the man who kidnapped and murdered. Y'all have proof? We do. Okay. Oh my god. Do you, oh my god. I know. I would not walk in here and tell you this if I did. Okay? Okay. okay. okay, listen to me. Take, take a deep breath. Take a deep breath because you asked me for proof, okay? It's hard for you to believe because you think you know him real oh, well. No, I would never okay. be associated with him. But it's, we know that. Okay. You're accusing you of Listen everything. to me. Oh my listen. god. Listen. 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 Take it. Take a deep breath. You want to hear the facts, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. What's the okay. Okay. okay, listen. I cannot lay out 100% of it, okay? Not at this point. He used me. Okay, he's good at it. That's what he does. He is a sociopath. I believe he, him. He's a manipulator, okay? He's also booked on first-degree murder and kidnapping charges. He was then indicted on July 18th for two counts of first-degree murder, which surprised everyone. So who was the second first-degree murder charge for? In 1999, a woman by the name of Lisa Pate had disappeared. Lisa had a history of drug abuse and had twice undergone drug treatment. She had even spent some time in jail, but was released in 1998. In June of 1999, her family became concerned when she failed to show up for one of her children's birthday parties. Three months later, on September 21st, a couple exploring the property behind a house they were renting at 2290 Brigman Highway near Church Point, Louisiana, found Lisa's skeletal remains. It's estimated that she was murdered on or around July 3rd. As for Mickey's remains, on August 7, 2012, police received a tip leading them to a property near Highway 10 and Highway 13 in Evangeline Parish. Upon searching the location, they found a buried site. Crime scene technicians got to work processing the scene, and by 8.30 p.m. that night, a body was discovered and removed. On August 9th, the remains were positively identified as belonging to Mickey Shunick. After being arrested and charged with both murders, he initially pleaded not guilty. However, after learning that prosecutors were seeking the death penalty, he accepted a plea deal. Part of the plea agreement was for him to plead guilty and tell what happened to the victims. Lisa and Laverne met in 1999, and he convinced her to leave Lafayette with him.
However, after spending a few days together, Pate decided she wanted to go to Lafayette to see her children, but Laverne refused to let her leave. At this point, Laverne was extremely angry and proceeded to beat and choke Pate. Sadly, she would die shortly after the attack. He then dumped her body behind a former acquaintance's home and covered the remains with wood. As for Mickey, Laverne had rammed her bike with his truck. He then got out and forced her into the passenger seat, grabbed her bike, and threw it in the back of his truck. Once she was in the passenger seat, she attempted to grab her cell phone to call for help, but he pulled out a knife and threatened her. She responded by spraying mace in his face. As he was trying to get the mace away from her, she grabbed the knife and stabbed him several times. They continued fighting, and he eventually got the knife back and stabbed her multiple times. Thinking she was dead, he drove to a sugarcane field in North Acadia Parish, where he planned to dump her body. However, Mickey wasn't quite dead and jumped up, grabbed the knife, and lunged at him, stabbing him in the chest. In retaliation, he grabbed his gun and shot her, killing her instantly. Instead of dumping her at the sugarcane field, he drove home with her body still in the passenger seat. He dressed his wounds and got rid of his clothes and other evidence. He then drove her body to an old cemetery in Evangeline Parish, where he planned to bury her. However, due to his injuries, he was unable to dig, so he left her body in a nearby tree line and covered her with branches and other debris. Even though she lost the battle, I really commend her for fighting for her life and nearly killing this piece of shit. The next day, he drove to the Whiskey Bay area and threw her bike in the water. He then drove to his friend's home in New Orleans, where he got rid of the handgun and threw the knife in a dumpster. He then went to the ER around 10 p.m. to get treated for his life-threatening wounds. After being released from the hospital on May 20th, he drove back to Mickey's remains and buried her. He then returned home and burned any remaining pieces of evidence, including Mickey's book bag. Once he noticed that police had captured his truck on surveillance camera, he drove to Texas and burned it. He then reported it stolen, and on June 4, 2012, he purchased an almost identical pickup truck. He then bribed a DMV worker with $500 to print him a license without the sex offender label on it. Investigators believe that Laverne could also be involved in the disappearance of Alexandria Joy Lowitzer. She disappeared from Spring, Texas on April 26, 2010, after getting off the school bus. Witnesses reported seeing a white truck pull over in the area where she was last seen. One witness even got the first few digits of the truck's license plate, and a private investigator said those numbers matched the plates from Laverne's truck. However, Alexandria remains missing, and Laverne has never been charged in the case. As of 2023, he is currently serving his life sentence at the Louisiana State Penitentiary. Rochelle Lee Ward was born on September 6, 1968. In 1983, 14-year-old Rochelle lived in Red Bluff, California, and was described as the sweetest person you could ever meet. It was said that she loved everybody and everything, including animals, and also enjoyed visiting nursing homes and playing checkers with the residents. On the morning of March 3rd, Rochelle left home and began the five-block walk to the Seventh-day Adventist School on South Jackson Street, but sadly, she would never make it. By noon that day, her body was discovered seven miles away at the Pine Creek Bridge on Pine Creek Road. She had been bound, sexually assaulted, and shot to death. A witness actually saw the assault, but thought it was a man attacking another man. From that, they were able to generate a composite sketch of the suspect. While DNA wasn't used at the time to solve cases, the detective still collected several items from the crime scene and made sure they were well preserved. After her murder, investigators received numerous tips, which led to multiple persons of interest being questioned, including Henry Lee Lucas. I mean, really, is there any murder in the 80s that Lucas didn't falsely confess to? Eventually, rumors about Sheriff Ron Koenig's possible involvement began to sweep through the community. At one point, a grand jury investigated allegations of an inappropriate child ring. The rumors weren't helped by the fact that Rochelle used to babysit for him. Plus, a classmate of Rochelle's came forward and said that Rochelle had come to school one day and claimed that Kay Nig sexually assaulted her. She said she had evidence and that the ring was using the tunnels under the city to film the inappropriate materials. 
In the end, the grand jury couldn't find any evidence to bring charges against him. Koenig was never charged with any of the crimes he was accused of, and I can't tell you if he was guilty or not. However, I can tell you he did not murder Rochelle. In 2022, detectives decided to have the evidence items resubmitted for DNA testing. The results didn't lead to the killer, so they decided to try genetic genealogy. Astria Forensics was hired to create a DNA profile of the suspect using a rootless strand of hair found on Rochelle. Investigators were then given a possible lead, a man by the name of Johnny Lee Coy, who used to live in Red Bluff and had a violent criminal past. In 1989, Coy flagged down and kidnapped a mother and her 21-year-old daughter from the Antelope Boulevard area and forced them to drive up Highway 36 East at gunpoint. He then sexually assaulted the daughter before stealing their car and personal belongings. When he was finally tracked down and arrested, they found him carrying a pistol, a large hunting knife, and 13 bags of meth. He was later arrested for the crime and sentenced to two life terms in prison. Unfortunately, he died in 2019, so detectives had to reach out to relatives of his to obtain a DNA sample. They concluded a couple of DNA tests which showed the DNA recovered from the crime scene was a close relative to the family members who provided their DNA. Coy's DNA was actually in CODIS, but when it was entered, they weren't using as many DNA markers as they use today. So, investigators requested a re-upload using today's technology, and from that, they were able to confirm the match through CODIS. Stacy Fairchild was born to parents David and Rebecca in Lancaster, Ohio, on March 3, 1971. In 1989, 17-year-old Stacy was a senior at Lancaster High School and worked at the clothing store Deb Shop in the River Valley Mall. On February 2nd, Stacy left work just before 9 p.m. and usually made it home by 11 p.m. However, by 2 a.m., there was still no sign of Stacy, and her parents decided to report her missing. The police initially suspected that she had run away with her boyfriend, but that couldn't be further from the truth. At 5 p.m. that day, someone walking their dog near some railroad tracks about a mile south of Collins Road found her burnt out 1982 black Dodge Aries. Then on February 5th, Stacy's fully clothed body was found floating in the Hawking River about a mile south of Edie Road, not far from the River Valley Mall. She had been sexually assaulted and drowned in the river. Three days later, on February 8th, her wallet was located near Hunter's Run Bridge on Lincoln Avenue. Thankfully, they were able to collect DNA from her body, but it would still take another 20 years to solve the case. Investigators began interviewing Stacy's boyfriend, friends, and relatives. They performed polygraphs on persons of interest and collected DNA from 13 people. However, none were matches. On June 27, 2007, the Lancaster Police received a phone call from the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation, informing them that the DNA from Stacy's murder matched the DNA from an unsolved 2006 robbery at Network Tan and Video in Lancaster. Then, on September 4th of the same year, the BCI was able to link the DNA from both cases to 44-year-old Lindy William Dysart. In 2007, Dysart spent six months behind bars for a robbery conviction, and that's when his DNA was collected. After linking the DNA to him, he was arrested and charged with one count of aggravated murder and one count of murder. In the end, Dysart pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter and was sentenced to 7 to 25 years in prison and then 10 years for the network tan and video robbery. He was 25 years old when he murdered Stacy and lived with his wife and children at 316 Hunter Avenue, which was only a couple of blocks from where her wallet was found. Dysart claims he was under the influence of drugs and alcohol on the night he kidnapped and murdered Stacy. As of 2023, he has never shown remorse nor provided the full details of the night. <laughs> 